Today we're in the Gospel of John, chapter 6. Last time we were studying how Jesus taught folks that he was the bread of life and, and a lot of what that meant. And we ended up reading at verse 40. Uh, we really didn't dig into the last three verses. And so today I'm going to start at verse 38. I'm going to read from the New King James Version. Uh, I'm going to title the teaching, Eternal Life is Nothing to Complain About. Eternal life is nothing to complain about. So that'll be interesting. Gospel of John chapter 6, verse 38. For I have come down from heaven, not to do my will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. Then the Jews complained about him because he said, I am the bread which came down from heaven. And they said, is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. No one can come to me unless the father who sent me draws him. And I will raise him up at the last day. And as, as it is written in the prophets, they shall, be, they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Eternal life. Life everlasting. Living forever. Jesus is talking about this a lot. Have y'all noticed that? These terms are at least used 14 times in the first six chapters of the Gospel of John that we've been studying. Now, similar terms are used in the Hebrew Scriptures, commonly called the Old Testament. So I'm going to take a quick look at what the Hebrew Scriptures teach us on this as Jesus was talking to uh, people who were supposed to be studying the Hebrew Scriptures. First, Psalm 90, verse 2 says, Before the mountains were brought forth, or ever you had formed the earth and the world, even from everlasting to everlasting, you are God. So God himself has always existed from everlasting and will always exist to everlasting. Now, second, it talks about things that are everlasting. Many of the things that God has spoken will continue to exist forever. And this is encouraging to us his promises, his agreements with his people, his guidance on, on how to have uh, how your heart attitude should be and one of the verses that, that talks about that is Genesis 17 7 it says and I will establish my covenant between me and you and your descendants after you in their generations for an everlasting covenant to be God to you and to your descendants after you and, and another thing is God's love God's love goes on forever. Jeremiah 31, 3 says, The Lord has appeared of old to me, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. So, um, the next thing we see actually jumps into the New Testament in, in the Jesus time. And it's... Um, for Jesus, his life did not begin at birth, as we studied before. His life is also from everlasting. Micah 5, 2 prophesies of Jesus and says, But you, Bethlehem of Ephrathah, though you are little among the thousands of Judah, yet out of you shall come forth to me the one to be ruler in Israel, whose going forth, goings forth are from old, from everlasting. Now, these things were well known to the leaders and should also have been commonly known among the people that were there. And so you may ask, why does Jesus suddenly talk about eternity and, and everlasting life so much now? Well, especially as we read in uh, Matthew 25, 35, Jesus makes it clear that his words are valuable and true well beyond time and eternity. He says, heaven and earth shall pass away, but my words, by no means, will by no means pass away. So the statement by Jesus puts him on the same way as Yahweh, the eternally existent God. The listeners there would know that dozens of times in the Torah, 
The first five books of the Bible, they were told that God's words would be forever. But not once, not anywhere in the Torah was there a promise or even a mention of eternal life for mankind. But rather that mankind had chosen death, told the story about he had chosen death over life. So here's the kicker that a lot of Christians don't understand. Uh, while the Jewish people do believe that God is eternal, the concept of eternal life for a believer, even today, is not really a core belief among the faithful. In fact, even the leaders of Jewish day were divided in their, in their beliefs about the possibility of someone rising from the dead, even with God's power. There were several sects, as we know, the Pharisees said, yes, people can rise from the dead. The Sadducees said, no, that doesn't happen. And they were, if you want to start an argument in one of their meetings, you just say, who's going to live forever? <laughs> and they, they start fighting, <laughs> okay? It was not a good situation. And as we look at that, that could explain several of the things that we've been studying uh, here. Because if there was not hope for eternal life, then it actually made sense to set Jesus up as an earthly king. Okay, we see that happen, and Jesus said, no, I'm not going to be your earthly king. Don't, don't put me there. But they're looking at it, and they're saying, and you're thinking, you know, it would be great to have, you know, a, God is our king. Uh, we'd have perfect justice. We'd have perfect laws. And so they thought that was, a, you know, going to be the best benefit of following Jesus. It would also explain why those who already had power over the people were so against Jesus as he was gathering followers and they were actually pointing out flaws in their actions and their beliefs. Um, you know, they all, the only power they had to look forward to, the only life they had was right here. They, want, they didn't want to lose their power. So the question that I started asking myself when I, when I studied this out was, well, was physical life after death, death indicated at all in the Hebrew scriptures? And the answer is yes, there, it is there. There are actually hints in a lot of locations, but there are very uh, specific passages that address this concept, three of them that, that jumped out to me. And, and as I read them, the, the verses, uh, the, the studies also in Thessalonians and Revelation came to, to my mind and uh, you know they, they bring all that stuff right close together. There's not much difference. And I'm gonna start with Isaiah 26, 19. It's very clear. Your dead shall live together with my dead body, physical body, they shall arise. Awake and sing, you who dwell in dust, in the ground, in the grave, for your dew is like the dew of herbs, and the earth shall cast out their dead. What does that sound like to y'all? <laughs> the book of Daniel tells of the end times and reveals a little bit more about what the Revelation speaks of in the book of life, chapter in Daniel chapter 12, verses 1 to 3. At that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince, which stands over the sons of your people. And there shall be a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that time. And at that time, your people shall be delivered, everyone who is found written in the book. And many of those who sleep in the dust of the earth shall awake, some to everlasting life, some to shame and everlasting contempt. Those who are wise will shine like the brightness of the firmament, and those who turn many to righteousness like the stars forever and ever. So that gives you both hope and also not so much hope for those that are not uh, doing, the, doing what God wants them to do. And in what many consider to be the first book that was written in the Bible, uh, Job, in chapter 19, verses 25 to 27, Job declares, I, for I know my Redeemer lives, and he shall stand at last on the earth. And after my skin is destroyed, I know this, that in my flesh I shall see God, whom I shall see for myself, and my eyes shall behold, and not another. How my heart yearns within me. So he was looking forward from very early times to seeing God again in a resurrected fleshly body after his death. So the Hebrew scriptures did teach this life, um, that there would be a resurrection of the dead, very consistent again with Thessalonians and uh, the book of life and then in, the, in Revelation and the final judgment uh, in, Re in Revelation. So, you know, you have eternal life or eternal shame and contempt in that, those verses. So surely the Jewish people there understood all of that, right? 
I mean, after all, Jesus was a Jew. He came to the Jews. They witnessed Jesus actually bringing people back to life. They saw Jesus himself had risen and overcome the power of death, right? So they understood all this, right? No. <laughs> Sadly, they didn't. I mean, even today, um, I, I kept looking it up thinking, okay, someone here is going to have a very definitive, you know, in, the, in Judaism, going to say, okay, yeah, we know about eternal life. Well, it's, it's pretty vague when you look up in, in Jewish uh, journals and Jewish questions and, and Jewish websites that I've, I've looked through. Um, they're pretty vague when it comes to what happens to a body, soul, and spirit after death. If they believe in life after death at all, they don't really know or agree on what totally qualifies people to have that life and whether there's a physical body or not or what it's like or you know who might get it and when um, and so for the most part they pretty much don't even talk about it at all and that's pretty sad and we see Jesus over and over here talking about eternal life um, you know I, I kind of thought this must be like having a dad who's like crazy rich and, and loves you to death um, and, and promised, I'm going to send you some, some gifts, and some great gifts in a book that unlocks all the secrets of every kind of success you could imagine that will give you, you know, everything you've ever wanted and, and more. And, and you're saying, hey, that's great. I'm still, you're still waiting for the package. And you don't realize that it was in that box that he sent to you years ago. But you looked at the box and said, oh, that's just a junk box. It looks different than what I expected. You threw it out in the woods. And it's still there. It's never been opened. You're still waiting. The <laughs> gift is still there. Jesus says in verse 38 in our, in our text, For I have come down from heaven not to do my own will, but the will of him who sent me. This is the will of the Father who sent me, that of all he has given me I should lose nothing, but should raise it up at the last day. Jesus came to do what the Father sent him to do. He's not refusing to give the Father's blessings out. He's not saying, ah, I got the box of goods and I'm going to hide it from you unless you do this or do this other thing. No, no. He says here that God's will and by extension his will is that nobody should be lost. He wills that everyone will receive that blessing of a final resurrection. He's talked about it in the previous chapters. He repeats and expands on it in verse 40. And this is the will of him who sent me, that everyone who sees the Son and believes in him may have everlasting life. And I will raise him up at the last day. That's twice in two verses. He talks about raising him up in the last day. Our life lesson is that when Jesus promises that you may have eternal life, believe him. You may have eternal life. <laughs> when Jesus promises that you may have eternal life, believe him you may have eternal life. And there's no question, there's no ambiguity, there's no doubts of what the Father God intends. The Father's will is that everyone see the Son. And I'm, when I saw this, it's like, okay, we got a little rabbit trail coming up. All right, this is another connection to the Hebrew Scriptures. Um, we, we mentioned uh, this, this happening before in, in Hebrews, uh, I mean, in Numbers chapter 21, uh, they were plagued by the deadly serpents. Now, when the serpents bit them, they died. They called out to God for relief. And basically, they were repenting of, of, of some bad attitudes that they had had. And God directed Moses to construct a bronze or a copper serpent, serpent in a pole. And in verse 9, the Bible says, He did, and so it was, if a serpent had bitten anyone, when he looked at the bronze serpent that had been lifted up, he lived. Simply looking upon that symbol brought healing and life to those in the desert that had been bitten by the serpent. Now, do you see how he's connecting that together? The devil disguised himself as a serpent to bring rebellion, sin, and death to all of mankind in the Garden of Eden. In the wilderness, the serpent bit some people and they died as well. But when they cried out to God, he provided life to those who were bitten. How? By grabbing that serpent and swinging it around? No, no. <laughs> By worshiping that serpent? No. By doing good deeds and by, you know, joining certain clubs? No. They looked at it. They looked at it. And 
the, the, the sickness was gone. They were healed. They lived. Did you know that the Israelites actually saved that bronze serpent? I, I'm sorry, I was ignorant. I didn't know that until several days ago. They, they kept it. Fast forward 700 years after this incident in the wilderness. Not only did they save that bronze serpent, but they turned their hearts away from the God to deliver them through, through just looking at the bronze serpent. They started burning incense to it, and they worshipped this bronze serpent. <laughs> We're told in 2 Kings 18.4 that King Hezekiah, King Hezekiah, when he came in power, did what? He had to break it in pieces to stop this from happening anymore. And Hezekiah trusted and worshipped and established worship of Yahweh, the Lord, the true God. Now, we think, oh, isn't that crazy? They started worshipping this thing. But are there things in your life that sometimes you put above God by your actions, by your attitudes, by your time, by your affections? You know, it's not hard to slip up a little bit. And uh, when you don't see God right in front of you all the time, you're not focused on Jesus, um, it's not hard to stray a little bit. So our life lesson here is worship the true and living God and only Him. Worship the true and living God and only Him. So, rabbit trail ending, bring it back to our text. Now Jesus is saying that not just looking upon Him, but also believing in Him, worshiping Him, will bring people everlasting life. So as they had worshipped this bronze serpent, they were worshipping the wrong, <laughs> the wrong thing. And so he's saying, you know, uh, believe in me. Look on me. Believe in me. You'll have eternal life. Why? Because everyone that was bitten by the serpent, so to speak, the serpent in the Garden of Eden, not the one in the wilderness, but the sin and rebellion that we accepted in the Garden of Eden, um, there is a problem. We all have sin. Romans 3.23 reminds us, For all have sinned and come short of the glory of God. Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life through Jesus Christ our Lord. And yes, every one of us humans do have an appointment with death. We, we don't put it on our calendar, at least most of us don't. <laughs> We don't know when it's going to be, but we'll all have to go through this passageway that temporarily takes us away from those that we love, from other humans that we've grown to love and, and cherish. But Jesus promises us that if you've trusted the Father and trust His Son, even that blow of death against our mortal bodies will be rendered without meaning in the grand scheme of things. And Jesus Himself has all power and all authority to bring life back to you and to create another body for you, and for you to inhabit forever, one that won't ever be corrupted again. One that, just amazing. And he's made the choice. And your, your, your work is to believe. You know, you have one job, believe. So let's go to verse 41. I mean, this would, this would really, this is incredibly good news. And here you'll see where the title is from because Jesus had just told them about how they can have this eternal life. Verse 41, Then the Jews complained about him because he said, I am the bread of life which came down from heaven. Verse 42, And they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? And now, by the Jews here, John's not talking about the hundreds or maybe even thousands of Jewish people that were, you know, trying to get into the synagogue that day and, and, and listening to Jesus. He's referring to the religious and political leaders who have been sent by others that were holding the power in the country. They have a greater interest in building their own temporary power base there in Israel at that time than they do in following the will of God the Father in their lives. Or at least they think they have a greater interest in doing that. Well, and honestly, when you do that, when you're in a political power grab or a religious power grab, you don't care who gets in the way. You don't care who you hurt. And it's especially bad when it's in a, in a, in a context of your eternal soul because souls will be lost forever in that situation. If, if you're successful in grabbing power away from or grabbing the, the affection of, uh, from somebody, when it should be placed on God, that's, that's, a, that's a big problem. There's a bad judgment coming for you, brother. <laughs> so 
Anyway, they're hearing the unmistakable message from Jesus in this passage that he came down from heaven. This was the third time he mentioned this as he was talking to them. And he's going to mention it as we study further. He's going to mention it three more times before this chapter is done that he came down from heaven. But these leaders, at this point, they're not even confronting Jesus. As you notice before, they, they came to Jesus and they couldn't, they really couldn't take his answers. They, they didn't know what to say. And so they're kind of slithering through the crowd. They're murmuring and complaining about the one whom God sent to them. They were sowing seeds of doubt and discord. This group, the day before, this group was ready to force Jesus to be their earthly king. And so these people were in there trying to, to get him to uh, you know, get him to go the other way. Oh, you don't want him. Oh, he's just, you know, he's, he's lying. And some of the people there, they knew about Jesus' supernatural birth. They knew about the supernatural events surrounding John the baptizer. And, and they also knew that a few years earlier, John and many others had actually witnessed a dove descending upon Jesus at his baptism. They heard the voice from heaven where the Father God identified him as his son. Um, so the leaders were trying to stir up strife in them. In their failure to study the scriptures, they ignored the scriptures about the Messiah's first coming that were fulfilled in Jesus. And they're all over the Hebrew scriptures. They ignored the facts when they said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? And I notice here that they, they didn't say, Oh, this is Jesus, who's the son of Joseph. He didn't, they didn't make the statement. They asked them. And to me, that's, uh, you know, Oh, did you see the fireball that just went through the room a minute ago? Well, there wasn't a fireball came through the room, but that's a way of being deceptive without lying. And so they were trying to follow the letter of the law. They were careful not to lie, but they were also not caring at all that they were sowing discord and disrespecting the Son of God in the process. So um, they knew that although he was raised by Joseph, he was born of God through the Holy Spirit, and Joseph was his earthly adopted father. And then they kept going. They didn't stop there. They stirred up more trouble saying, how then is it written? I, how, excuse me, how is it then that he says, I have come down from heaven? And, and though it's not recorded here, uh, I'm, I'm guessing they may have even, you know, tossed in, you know, about Daniel. And we know in Daniel chapter 7, verse 13, he says, I saw in the night visions and behold, one like the son of man came with the clouds of heaven. So, uh, two things, that verse all makes it very clear that they knew that the Son of Man was, re was referring to the Messiah, the Son of God. And it came down with a cloud from heaven. Now that verse, if you look at that passage, I want to encourage you to read all of Daniel chapter 7. Because it's a beautiful passage. And when you understand it in context, and you'll see that this vision that Daniel was seeing was not about the initial coming of Messiah. Almost 2,000 years ago, a little over 2,000 years ago now. Uh, but it definitely matches up with what will be happening in the future, likely soon during the last days. So they didn't want to let the facts confuse the issue. So <laughs> all they wanted to do was stir up down and say, he didn't come in the clouds, he was born. Unfortunately, complaining actually does that. Um, it stirs up that confusion. And um, doubts were running through the crowd and it happens. You know, Jesus was bringing the incredible, again, the incredible great news of eternal life for all people. Um, he's probably at the point, probably as close to an altar call, for instance, as we have nowadays. And, you know, getting, encouraging people to believe in Jesus and to believe in him. And then the enemy goes in there and starts stirring up doubt and confusion. It happened to Jesus. Yeah, and, you know, I think all of y'all have seen it happen in our churches. You've happened... When you're per it's happening when you're personally sharing the good news about Jesus with others. And if you're sharing about Jesus with others and something comes, it might be from that person, he might throw out a question that just totally has nothing to do with him trusting in Jesus. Um, you know, the devil might inspire him to, <laughs> to, to ask you a, a question that nobody's ever answered in, in eternity. <laughs> or it might be someone else walking up or it might be some other activity happening. 
But you ever notice that when you get to the point where it's time for someone to make a decision for Jesus, something happens to distract them in many cases. So we have to look, how did Jesus handle that? Well, very well, I think. In verse 43, people were stirring up division. Jesus therefore answered and said to them, do not murmur among yourselves. That's all I said. <laughs> then he went right back in verse 44. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up the last day. I will raise him up at the last day. So Jesus recognized the situation. He quickly but firmly diffused it, and it seemed that he ignored the complaints and continued sharing the words that his Father had given to teach the people. Now our life lesson here, very practical, the enemy will try to sidetrack sharing the gospel. Just quickly and lovingly diffuse the situation and keep sharing. The enemy will try to sidetrack sharing the gospel. Quickly and lovingly diffuse the situation and keep sharing. So, okay, we know that Jesus' instructions not to murmur and complain don't have any present-day application in our lives, so we'll just move right along, okay? <laughs> well, actually, that's not what we do here, so... Um, what's the problem with a little complaining? What harm could it do? Well, apparently plenty. Um, this, this gets too close to home, you know? But the, remember the axiom that, that says, I can't complain. It wouldn't do any good anyway. <laughs> well, it's, it's actually true. But let's look at the other side of it. Philippians 2, 14 through 16 says, Do all things without complaining and disputing, that you may become blameless and harmless, children of God without fault in the midst of a crooked and perverse generation, among whom you shine as lights in the world, holding fast the word of life so that I may rejoice in the day of Christ, that I have not run in vain or labored in vain. I mean, apparently, you know, you look at the converse of that, and apparently complaining does do some things against you personally. Uh, it, it causes you harm. It puts blame on you when you complain about someone else. It actually shows your faults. It keeps you from letting the light of Jesus shine in your life. It hinders you from holding fast to God's word. It causes you to, and others to miss joy in their life. And it could possibly cause your work for the Lord to become meaningless. And it can actually prevent others from coming into the kingdom of God. Now, I don't know about y'all, but that's not where I want to go with my life. So... What can you do when there are honest concerns and doubts in your spiritual walk? Well, we've seen in quite a bit of our reading that most issues can be resolved when you look further into God's Word. You find out more about a specific thing that's concerning you. Consider the context, the other references, related passages. Um, you know, sometimes even the individual meanings of words. And it usually doesn't hurt to discuss the concern about another trusted believer that you know studies the Bibles out and has a track record of hearing from the Holy Spirit on these matters. And I, I said, discuss, okay? Not complain and stir up strife. Sometimes, well, I'm just telling them what it's like. Uh, look at your heart before you go there, okay? <laughs> because it's, you know, discussing and complaining, uh, sometimes there's a fine line. So first thing, of course, is to pray and ask God to show you the right way and trust that he will do that. In fact, uh, that's always the first step. And that brings us to the life lesson, the next life lesson. The urge to complain is really an inward signal to seek more of God's help and to trust in his responses. And we saw that in the lesson today. The urge to complain is really an inward signal to seek more of God's help and to trust in his responses. Now, earlier I said it seems that Jesus ignored their complaining. However, as we study our text today, we see he actually continues in teaching, and that shows us a great response. That is his response to their complaining and murmuring, is that he continues sharing the word of God. Jesus immediately begins teaching more of the ways of God. He says, no one can come to the Father. And come in, no one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him. This was so different than the people there were thinking. We've studied about how God did so many things for his people um, and, and showed them he was a true God. And, uh, and also to show, 
for, those, for his people to show others around them, the other nations, that God was the true God. There was even a place built into the, the map, to the floor plan of the temple grounds to, for the Gentiles to come and to help them know the true and living God. But most of the Jews there had forgot about those things. All they thought about that was that they were all chosen by God because of the virtue of who their mom and dad were, who were their, their physical birth. But here Jesus makes it clear that Father God himself draws a person to come to the Savior. Plus, everyone who responds to the Father will respond to the Son. And unless God does this, no man can ever or will ever come to Christ. Without his drawing through the Holy Spirit, people simply won't feel the need for a Savior. Sometimes a person will want to take their lead in a relationship with God. I'm going to go find God. Well, according to the scripture, according to Jesus, it doesn't work that way. The truth is, he calls us and we come. There are two more truths that come out of this. First is that we should never resist the Holy Spirit's drawing us to Jesus. We truly do not know when and if his drawing will happen. It's not worth the risk of missing his call on our lives, whether it's for initial salvation or initial trusting in Jesus, or whether it's for a deeper relationship, or whether it's for something else that he wants to do in your life. Don't resist the Holy Spirit's drawing you. And the second thing is, it's not about us, it's about other people. Understanding God's uh, initiative in salvation, he is calling people. It should make us more confident in our evangelism, more confident in sharing, knowing that God is drawing people and we can expect that he will lead us to those persons whom the Father is leading to Christ. The term John uses here for draw is really a Greek translation of the Hebrew word that Jeremiah Here's God saying in Jeremiah 31, 3, The Lord has appeared to me of old, saying, Yes, I have loved you with an everlasting love. Therefore, with loving kindness, I have drawn you. Now, you know, y'all know that I've recently had a, a grandson, and I'm not one of those that always shows pictures of the, but I'll, I'll, put them, I'll keep them away. But, you know, I, I picture, you know, my grand, my grandma, my grandpa, and whenever I saw them, they would hold their arms out to me. That was the draw. <laughs> it was come. I knew they loved me. I knew there was a drawing there. The, the drawing, I mean, I could have just turned and pfft, go away. Someday that'll happen with my grandkids. And it happened so much with my own kids. It was, it's wonderful. But the drawing that God does is, um, is, is a, a gentle drawing. It's not irresistible. <laughs> Some people say it's irresistible grace. It draws someone against their own will. No. If a person does not believe, they won't come. We're not forced to Christ, but we're lovingly drawn by faith, by the free will of the heart, and the Holy Spirit draws us by love. And that is from the Father teaching them. And that's why when you, when you, uh, and when you encourage someone to come to Christ, when you witness to people, always use God's word, no matter what it is. You don't have to go through a certain plan or step-by-step -step thing every time, uh, but just tell them something that God has said. Because God, you know, how can God teach them if they're not listening to God? So we, we give them God's word, and it may only be one verse. I've heard people that have opened up a copy of God's word, read a verse that I, had, I thought no, had nothing to do with salvation, and yet that convicted. God used that to teach that person and to draw him to himself and to tell them they needed to come to Jesus. So praise God, let him use his word. And you see, the drawing is, again, it's not forcing us to come to Jesus, but actually confirms, this, this, this drawing actually confirms what we know that people do want to be encouraged to come. And the Father's drawing is that encouragement for them to come to Jesus. Now, finally, Jesus states, I will raise him up at the last day. So all those who do come to Jesus and believe in Jesus, having been drawn by the Father, will receive eternal life and will be resurrected at that last day, the final judgment, or when the books are opened, as, as the Revelation tells us. This is what Jesus has been teaching them and continues to emphasize, and he will continue teaching this through his entire ministry. Jesus says in the next verse, verse 45, 
It is written by the prophets, and they shall all be taught by God. Therefore, everyone who has heard and learned from the Father comes to me. Wow. Jesus had a great way of teaching and relating the things of God to the people right where they're at, right when they were there. He told the prophets, writing, they shall all be taught by God. Well, you remember this, this is set, right? Around the, close to the time of Passover. Um, the Hebrew scriptures readings uh, for each week and you know, for each day, um, a little while before this Passover time uh, covers Isaiah 54 and 55 and, and they're read in the synagogues. And so a few phrases that may be fresh in their minds and the listeners are, for instance, Isaiah 54, verse 6, the Lord, for the Lord has called you. Now remember, this is not Jesus in the flesh <laughs> in 30 AD or so. Uh, you're saying this, of course, Lord, you know, Jesus is the word of God, but this, this is the Hebrew scriptures. For the Lord has called you, much as Jesus was telling them that his father draws them to him. Verse 10, but my kindness shall not depart from you, nor shall my covenant of peace be removed. Jesus had just let them know that they would never be cast out. Verse 13, all your children shall be taught by the Lord and great shall be the peace of your children. Okay, you're seeing the connections here. Um, chapter, uh, the next portion, chapter 55, verse one. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. He's talking about that. Ho, everyone who thirsts, come to the waters. Verse two, why do you spend money for what is not bread and your wages for what does not satisfy? We talked about that a week or two ago as well. Verse three, come to me here and your soul shall live and I will make an everlasting covenant with you. Now notice there, I mean, there's so much more in there, uh, but you notice there that everlasting covenant he talks about here when he comes is not with the people as, the, as we've read so many times that God made a covenant with his people. He's saying with you, with you individually, that everlasting covenant. How can, a, how can you keep an everlasting covenant if you're dead? If you don't have life, he gives you that life. So that's, that's like four chapters now. You get, to, you get to go home and study a little further. Isaiah 54 and 55, reread all of John chapter 6, along with the Isaiah 54 and 55, and you'll see some amazing comparisons there. And the idea here is that all those who belong to God are taught by God, being drawn to him, and everyone who has heard and learn from a father comes to him, that's what Jesus is saying, and only those who are taught by the father can come to Jesus. And by contrast, if you're not coming to Jesus, he's as much as telling them the father has never taught you. You've not learned from him, or you would be coming to me. In your rejection of me, you're proving that you're strangers to the grace of God. I don't wanna be a stranger. Don't be a stranger to the grace of God. Don't be a stranger to God's word. Let him teach you. Let him draw you to Jesus. We'll pick up more the next time as we continue learning from Jesus. You know, if you're sensing the Heavenly Father is calling you, uh, drawing you to a stronger faith, a stronger belief or trust in him, don't, don't hold back. Today's your day. Do something about it. I'm excited. We have a couple folks here getting baptized today. So taking another step of faith. Praise the Lord. If you need some prayer, we'd love to take some time with you and, and pray with you. But right now, I'd like to pray a blessing over you from God's word. The Lord bless you and keep you. The Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious to you. The Lord lift up his countenance upon you and give you peace. In the powerful name of Yeshua HaMashiach, our Lord and Savior, Jesus the Christ. Amen. Thanks for being here.